Christ died. Uh, the death of Christ provided to me whereby there will never be no condemnation laid against you. It's, 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 it's based on Christ's death. If you say, if you say that you can lose your salvation, what you're saying is the death of Christ had no effect. That's right. Uh -huh. And I don't think we want to say that. No. Okay. It is Christ that died by his death, the penalty of the holy law on account of its violation by his people was executed and satisfied by divine justice. God saw it fit to justify the death of Christ to provide the penalty that he required to pay for sin. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Amen. I hope you get a hold of that. Uh -huh. In answer to the question, who is he that condemneth? The apostle replies that Christ died. By this he associates the impossibility of being accused of sin without satisfying for the injury done to the rights of God's justice. If someone can say <coughs> that your sins has caused you problems, then what you're doing, you're, you're accusing God's right to justify you. And I think that's not what you want to do. That's right. It is on this account that God has instituted the instituted sacrificial sacrifices under the law. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, God instituted the sacrifices under the law to hold forth the necessity of a satisfaction and to prove that without the shedding of blood there would be no remission of sin. There is then a manifest necessity of repairing the outrage against the perfection of God which are the original and fundamental rules of the duty of the creation. The fundamental duty of the creation of mankind is to bring glory to God. Amen. And when they don't do that, God gets outrageous. You say, well, God loves everybody. Let me share with you something. God don't love everybody. Amen. God is angry every day at the sin of the people. Right. His wrath rages against the lost. And this anger this rage of the wrath of God could only be made by a satisfaction that should correspond with the august majesty of His holiness. And consequently, it must be the infinite value which could only be found in the person of the infinite, finite, infinite dignity of Christ. So the, to the death of Jesus Christ as the atonement for sin, our eyes are constantly directed throughout the scriptures, whether in type or by prophecy or by historical description of the event. Death was the punishment threatened in the covenant works of sin. Yes, it's true that, as I said in the class this morning, God required death for sin. If you sin, death was required. If, a, if, 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 if you were caught in a sin, most sins in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the law required death. Most of us would have been dead anyway. If we lived in the Old Testament time, and Christ had not died, we'd all, be in trouble. we'd all be in trouble. Amen. Because God requires death for the penalty of sin. <laughs> but Jesus Christ had neither transgressed that covenant, nor could participate in the imputation of sin of Adam, because he sprang not from him by the way of natural generation, being therefore without sin, 
neither actual or imputed, the penalty of death could not be concurred on his own account. So Christ had nothing in him that would create the scenario that since he sinned, he would have to be put to death. But that never occurred. Death then, which is the wages of sin, right. must have been suffered by him for sinners. Amen. Their iniquities were laid on him, and by his stripes they are healed. His death therefore utterly forbids the condemnation of the elect of God who were given to him and are one with him and whom only the context speaks. Only the, in the context of this verse, he's only speaking of the elect. It must be a just and full compensation for their sin. It is evidently implied that none of whom he died can ha could be condemned. My contention is when Christ died on the cross, his death paid for the penalty of sin of everyone that was elected. Amen. Now I understand the controversy that most people want to say when Christ died on the cross, he died for every man. What I'm simply trying to say to you is if Christ's death was the means whereby God could justify the sinner and his death done that, then if Christ died for all mankind, then all mankind could go to heaven. Okay. I, that's all I'm trying to say. If you say that when Christ died on the cross that there will be some who his death would not apply to, you're saying that Christ's death was not effective for all men to be saved. And then you're putting a limit on God. Now I want you to chew on that a while. Christ died on the cross to those who were condemned and he died for the elect because that's the assurance that they will never, ever be condemned again. Amen. For if condemnation be forbidden by his death, then that, then that condemnation must be prohibited with respect to all whom he died. His death made satisfaction the just for them, and therefore, in their case, both accusation and condemnation are rendered impossible. Now, I understand that some people want to say, well, you have to, God died for everybody, you just have to believe it, and, and you just have to believe it. God death wasn't done randomly. God doesn't go, God doesn't say, you know, I just wonder whose blood I shed on the cross is going to be effective on. He died with a purpose in mind. Amen. Yea, rather, then secondly, is yea, rather, that is risen again. The second, the sec, the second argument that Paul makes that says you're guaranteed that you will not be condemned, is that when Christ died on the cross, guess what? He rose again. This is the second ground affirmed by the apostle against the possibility of the condemnation of God's elect. What purpose would the death of Christ have, secured, have served if he had been overcome and swallowed up by it? What if he had been killed on the cross and nothing happened after that? But had, what if he had never raised again? If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. vain. Ye are not in your sins. If he be not risen, it must be because he had not expedited those sins for which he died and was therefore retained a prisoner in death and he stayed in hell. If he had been a false Messiah and had died on the cross, he would have he would have been up he would have been with those on the in, the left side or the right side of the bosom of Abraham, and he would have been in hell. Amen. And everybody still would have been there. But since the surety has been released from the grave, complete 
sanctification must have been made. For, for if but one sin which had been laid upon him had continued unatoned for, he would have remained forever in the grave, death been the wages of sin. If one sin of one person had not been atoned for, then he would have remained in the grave. But now, since he's risen from the grave, the obligation against his people must be effective and entirely abolished. His resurrection being their resurrection, Colossians 2.12. It is on this account that the apostle has opposed to condemnation not only the death of Christ, but also his resurrection and something higher. Something higher, number three in the cruise. Not only did he die on the cross, not only did he raise from the grave, but to make it more possible, he's on the right hand of our own God. And by the commandment of Jesus Christ, the gospel was not announced to the Gentiles nor spread throughout the world till after his resurrection. The resurrection then of Christ is a proof of his victory and the death of Christ brought about the acquittal of that condemnation and it united us. And as the Father, by delivering him to death, condemned their sins in him, so in raising him from the dead, he pronounced the acquittal from all the sins that had been laid upon him. He was justified by the Spirit. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Very quickly, number 3. Who is even at the right hand of God? Now, Paul's first argument was that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Amen. That's not the full gospel. Secondly, he was raised from the grave. That's part two. Something further happened. The third ground on which the security of God's elect is rested, Jesus Christ sat at God's right hand. 